right, um, let's get started. Welcome everyone to the second Digital Duchenne and Becker webinar. My name is Suzanne. I will be your technical host for today. And on my side, I have Nicoletta. And um, next to that, we also have three presentations today of uh, people who want to share their experience on building a community. So just so you know, uh, we have some netiquette, some webinar etiquette is, one is then is to please have your real name on the screen. Keep your webcam on if you're comfortable with that. Please turn off your microphone. And if you want to have a question, you want to ask a, a question or an experience, please keep the chat box open. We will record this meeting. We will record the presentations, not the discussion. So uh, please feel comfortable to, to, to chime in and to contribute. So this is the agenda for today. After a little bit of introduction, what I'm doing right now, I will hand over the talking stick to Nicoletta, who will give a presentation on community building. Then we start with, uh, I think it was actually Nicolas who's going to start. So we might want to mix up a little bit the speakers here. Let's see who slides come first. Uh, so we have three speakers. We have Tatiana Gremiakova from Russia. She will explain a little bit about the background story of Gordy, which is her patient organization. Then we have Nicolas Schongut Gromus from Duchenne, Chile, and Claire Bailey from Duchenne, Australia. Then, as we say, we have an open discussion as a wrap up. Some timings might change a little bit, but that's up to us. So for that, I want to give you um, the floor, Nicoletta. Okay, thank you, Zosian. And uh, good morning or evening or afternoon uh, to all of you. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here again for these uh, webinars. And um, I just want to add one little point that maybe uh, you have seen in your uh, email that uh, Tali Kaplan from Israel was supposed to join the webinar. But unfortunately, as you can imagine, due to the uh, conflicts that they are living in uh, Israel, um, it's, uh, it, it is not possible for her, unfortunately, to, to participate today. So, uh, you know, she apologized, but of course, we, we fully understand uh, uh, the situation. Um, so, um, let's start uh, with a really quick introduction about community building, just to have a kind of overview of the key messages and the main important points. Um, then I will leave the, you know, uh, the opportunity, of course, to uh, all our fantastic speakers to present local experiences about how they created uh, an organization and how they are working uh, in their community, also facing some difficulties and achieving important goals. Thank you, Susanne. Next slide, please. Thank you. So as we know, all life coexists in community and community is actually uh, the key, uh, especially for those who really you know, need to make a difference for a reason, like in our case, raising awareness of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, normally the community is based on a mutual goal uh, support and common goals, uh, bigger than personal interest. So when we have to create a group, when we have to work within a community or to um, create actually a community, we really need a common goal and not a personal goal. Maybe we can start from a personal experience, but we actually need to involve people to uh, share a common objective. Um, this means that also we need a common strategies, plans and actions. Thank you, Suzanne. So the, the purpose of our community, um, when we you know, have to, to define the purpose, normally we have to ask ourselves um, what we want to you know, achieve. And uh, defining the the purpose is very important. Uh, so you can actually send uh, a kind of sign, a signal to the rest of the world to let everyone know what you are creating, why you are, you know, uh, setting up a group or, or an organization. Thank you, Suzanne. And uh, in order to work as a team effectively, uh, in, in order to reach a common goal, uh, there are two elements that are really, really important. So defining a specific mission in your organization and a specific vision. Thank you, Susanne. So a mission is important because it's an opportunity to explain uh, actually your goals 
and uh, your norms and values. Uh, so a strong mission statement to serve multiple function and uh, uh, this is very helpful to define objectives and uh, um, live for a long time, you know, so this is really extremely important. At the same time, a vision statement uh, is, is the strategic part that defines the intended future goal of an organization. Um, so in this case, you always have to, to think about objectives, priorities, and where you really have to invest some specific resources that are not only um, economical resources, but of course also and especially human resources. So in terms of time, ideas, time that you spend in reaching your goals. Thank you, Susanne. And now we have one really important word for the community, so stakeholder, because when you have defined your purpose and you need to pull together a group um, of people that are committed uh, to make it happen. So actually you really have to um, encourage participation by all those involved and uh, um, if stakeholders are involved, they uh, can help you in reaching the goals and uh, actually can really um, work very well in terms of responsibilities and the outcome of, uh, um, of your, uh, uh, you know, of your goal. So this is really, really important to involve uh, a really good number of people of different targets. Thank you, Susanne. Um, when we have to work with people of different targets to be involved in our community and to be part of our group, of course, we cannot avoid to use something that is extremely important in a community, in a community and this is communication, of course. So we use actually communication every day and that is always necessary when we have to build relationships, when we have to share ideas, when we have to also manage a team and much more. Um, in this case, when we think about a community, we think about internal communication and external communication. So two different approaches. Thank you, Susanne. For the internal communication, uh, you always have to listen to your communities. Uh, actually, you really have to collect the needs, um, challenges, frustrations. Uh, you always have to speak with the people uh, that are part of your community because, you know, this is a way to improve and maintain engagement. And in this case, you always have to work in two parallel ways when you um, work in for the internal community, uh, for the internal communication in your community. You always have to use an online uh, engagement and an offline engagement because online is extremely important to reach a big number of people that are maybe living in other countries like we are doing today or um, we have used a lot online communication during this pandemic but actually we cannot avoid <laughs> the face-to-face -face opportunities because they are extremely important in creating um, a community and uh, in you know uh, turn stronger uh, relationships between the community. Um, always uh, uh, the suggestion is to communicate in a really simple and clear way uh, and in a proper context. So, uh, you know, a bad communication approach can really create conflicts within the community. And um, also when we have, when you, for example, um, we use a lot for uh, Facebook or WhatsApp groups uh, to speak with our members and to speak within the communities, but it's extremely important that you use a proper channel when you have to discuss something that is not quick. Uh, so you have the opportunity to have an online meeting or maybe um, you know a face-to-face -face meeting. And uh, in terms of external communication is strictly linked to the internal communication. So again, when you have to work and to present your group and to present your organization, uh, as we always say, uh, we, you have to have a, a clear goal, uh, you have to um, be transparent and you, you really have to work in terms of harmony and union. 
Thank you, Susan. So thinking about some take home messages about uh, um, community building in general, we can say that community needs really a common goal and uh, really a clear goal um, that is absolutely bigger than the personal interest of needs. Uh, to be sustainable, community must develop authentic uh, grassroots democracy. So you really have to think about uh, cooperation and collaborate together to make decision democratically. Uh, communication is essential for engagement uh, and has to be really clear, realistic, and to reflect actually the, the community goal. And uh, another important point is that community building is actually an adventure. So it's, um, it's a continuous process. Uh, so we actually, even if we create a group, even if we create an organization and the organization is ready with our mission and vision with uh, you know, our activities uh, uh, in plan, planned, uh, we always have to consider that uh, we always have to work in terms of uh, engagement forever for, for the rest of the life of our group and organization. So it's um, something that you can organize every day, step by step. So it's extremely important to always to work in terms of engagement and a clear communication to keep your group, um, you know, strong, informed and active. Thank you, Susanne. So now we move to Russia <laughs> and I'm happy to introduce you to uh, Tatiana. Uh, Tatiana, so now you can present your experience and uh, just share all the fantastic things that you are doing in your country. Thank you so much, Nicoleta. And thank you so much for WDO to give us possibility to talk about uh, what has been already done and uh, how we um, managed to do this and what are we planning and to share our experience and our challenges and to get also experience from you. Uh, Susie, can, could you please change the slide? And uh, uh, <clears throat> our um, uh, patient and advocacy organization, the fund is uh, focused on systemic approach for care for different patients and their families. So we are not going to uh, work um, uh, with funds for each uh, individual um, uh, patient, but we are going to uh, <clears throat> deal with systemic problems and uh, to think more about uh, uh, groups and all the patients with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Next slide, please. So uh, some history of Gardi Fund, it's uh, rather new. It was uh, registered last year, June 23, by our family. We have uh, Gardi, uh, eight-year-old boy. He's my grandson. Uh, so he's, uh, he likes to be engineer. He likes to play uh, games. He likes Lego, like, like uh, all the other boys, he is just the same, but he has uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And again, we are focused on systemic projects and uh, our hashtags are uh, also focused on uh, being together, not individual. And uh, you can see that our hashtags are stronger than Duchenne, stronger together, and we uh, underline it whenever we can. Next slide, please. Uh, fund mission is improvement of all types of care for patients with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and their families to ensure high quality and duration of life uh, for patients. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> before starting uh, uh, working with um, uh, <clears throat> like patient advocacy organization, um, for three years already, three years and a half now, <clears throat> we were in the situation of just uh, parents and family with a boy uh, who had uh, this uh, Duchenne. 
and we were <clears throat> uh, in this um, atmosphere of the problems which actually I don't think they are very specific to Russia. They are uh, general to many populations, to many countries. Uh, and uh, this is lack of information for families and lack of doctors, insufficient of uh, amounts of specialized uh, centers and doctors, poor advocacy, problems of diagnostics, um, no encounter Russian events to discuss problems and solutions absence of schools for newly diagnosed families, absence of checkup pro uh, programs and poor development of rehabilitations, uh, no psychological support, uh, lack of relevant information concerning new therapies. And actually uh, what is common to all this problem and what combines all this problem is a lack of communication at all the levels at the levels of families, uh, levels of doctors, of state, of advocacy organization, and drug development companies. Next, please. Uh, and uh, uh, this was also the time when uh, COVID was uh, in its top uh, manifestation. And it appeared that we could not do uh, these events, uh, which we could do uh, earlier. And, uh, main instrument for us became uh, this was online work because we were isolated fully it was social and professional networks and maybe we were in better positions to those uh, organizations uh, organizations which were created early because we started at this situation so we did not had we did not have a preliminary experience of uh, face-to-face -face, uh, communication and we were obliged to develop uh, quickly instruments to um, uh, communicate to, to uh, families, to doctors and to state organs, uh, what, whatever. Next slide, please. So we uh, had a list of main times, uh, main tasks for uh, the period of uh, five years and this is to build a mature uh, parent medical community, to improve uh, pediatric diagnostics, to promote uh, development and implementation of federal diagnostic and screening program, uh, conduct a census of patients, uh, promote development and implementation of clinical guidelines because we don't have uh, clinical guidelines for our doctors uh, in Russian actually to provide patients with knowledge and access to better genetic therapy and promote creation of national network of neuromuscular centers um, based on the best uh, high-tech medical centers. Next, please. So uh, what we were, um, uh, what we have um, uh, reached during the first uh, half year of our work for, uh, to the beginning of this year, please next slide. Uh, and this almost all that we have achieved, uh, it, it was um, connected with community building. It was communication mainly. So it was interviews, you can see the uh, upper level, upper left uh, slide, interviews, publications, presentations, TV, uh, interview for, for radio, for, for uh, various organizations. Then it was event, which we events, various events on various levels and the uh, huge, uh, the largest was um, conference which we were able to conduct in December and there was more than 500 registrations though it was uh, done very shortly and we had uh, about 20 doctors who were participating and 20 families and it appeared that it is a very good experience because if it was if, if you organize it uh, on face-to-face um, -face, uh, uh, base, then these families would not be able to participate, to come and they will, uh, and in online format, they all were participating and they were very happy to get this new knowledge. So we had international participation, very strong international participations of the experts or in DMD and we had definitely uh, simultaneous interpreta interpretation and all this information then was given to all the families and it was you see a very strong input to uh, information to families and to doctors about what is DMD 
and how to care, uh, how to handle it. Uh, then uh, communities. So you see, we, we used these uh, uh, social uh, <clears throat> uh, networks and uh, we uh, contacted uh, through Facebook, through uh, uh, other uh, networks, and uh, we were able to make uh, about 150 consultations for families. Uh, then um, we have created six groups in Facebook. It, it, one group is general for, for all Russian speaking um, uh, families and uh, doctors who are interested in this. And to the end of uh, last year, we had already starting from zero, we had more than 400 uh, participants in this group. Uh, so it's large uh, participation and we have created five uh, targeted groups, uh, targeted group to various um, uh, therapists, nonsense mutations, uh, exon skipping mutations, and one group for those who are 14 plus, so that all people could communicate jointly, but also have uh, some specific uh, individual information, uh, which is uh, interesting for uh, small specific groups of families and patients. Then if, when we go to the lower uh, line, uh, you can see that uh, interactions. So we uh, <clears throat> uh, started, uh, we, we tried to interact with uh, uh, international uh, organizations and companies respected uh, like World Duchenne Organization, like Treatment D. Um, uh, in Russia, there is a cessation of professional participants of uh, hospice members, and we are uh, working with them as well. So we, uh, during half a year, we were able to write about 30 letters to all kind of levels of ministries and state about the problems of Duchenne. And this was also communication, but on the, on the other level about uh, problems of the community uh, with Duchenne. Uh, we were communicated externally with uh, the pharmaceutical and biotechnological companies concerning their products and possibility of clinical trials in Russia. Um, and uh, we uh, participated in um, uh, the work of a public chamber, a Russian public chamber, uh, at the time when uh, a governmental um, fund, a circle of uh, kindness was formed, and it is a fund uh, to um, give uh, funds uh, for orphan uh, drugs for various nosologies, and we were uh, <clears throat> combating to be including uh, to be included for Duchenne uh, to be included in this list and we were successful and it is in the list uh, for funding uh, and also um, Olga uh, Grimikova who is the uh, founder of this uh, our organization she is a member of this uh, uh, fund and she is participating in uh, work of expert committee and uh, uh, in April, we had expert committee, which was considering um, uh, uh, considering new genetic uh, uh, drugs, uh, treatments for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and we are waiting for these results. So it was a great work also. Then if we're talking about education, it's definitely communication. And uh, it communication again on mo a lot of levels. We had uh, education for our staff from World Gen organization, but we also um, organized lecture for um, uh, doctors, and there was organized the lesson of kindness uh, for um, uh, uh, kids for them to understand what what uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is. And uh, we were able, the last but not least, that we were communicating with um, <clears throat> a medical community and we were able to start the new program and uh, involve a new high-tech uh, central clinic, uh, well-equipped well clinic. They started uh, working with Duchenne boys and they started their program uh, on checkups, but also on rehabilitation and uh, care and uh, 
it's uh, very very much uh, <clears throat> demanded uh, uh, program and uh, we have a lot of uh, good uh, <clears throat> Uh, feedbacks uh, from those uh, families uh, who were able to get this. It start. It, it just started. So you see, definitely, it's not uh, a lot of uh, people who were able to uh, get it. So last year it was uh, nine boys, but this was just starting. So and we uh, think that we shall be able to do much more this year and next year. Next, please, Susan. And uh, this is uh, the. the <clears throat> the photo, the banner, the banner for the conference, Duchenne 2020, which was organized. I have already talked about this, but you see that there were a lot of sponsors for this conference and a lot of partners for this for, uh, uh, conference. There were informational partners, there were business partners, there were medical partners, and we had general medical partner like uh, the Central Clinic. Uh, so it, it was very successful and it was uh, a result of um, uh, communication and efforts from a lot of organizations and a lot of experts who participated in this event. Next, please. So uh, I would uh, like to say some uh, words about uh, programs and projects which we are planning, uh, but very briefly. And next slide, please. Yes, because I'm also keeping an eye on the time. I think we got about three minutes. So, okay. okay. So I, I would say about this uh, Duchenne awareness because we have a problem uh, with diagnostics uh, in Russia. So we have about only quarter of patients visible, and uh, that is why our first project, which we uh, prioritize, is Duchenne awareness. And uh, we have a lot of plans, but what we had done. Uh, at the day of rare diseases, we have uh, 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 attracted, we have uh, engaged some um, uh, pediatricians uh, which uh, are well known and which have uh, a lot of uh, followers in um, uh, Facebook. And for example, Sergei Butry, you see, uh, he made uh, a speech, a video about Duchenne muscular dystrophy, about what is it and how to diagnose for pediatricians and uh, he had and this video had 4400 views so it's a, 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 it's a kind of we can do to uh, in, uh, to increase awareness and information among uh, uh, medical community next please and we shall see well so this is you see uh, against uh, together stronger than Duchenne and so we have a special program uh, for uh, developing of community of parents and doctors. Uh, so you will be able to uh, see more about this. Uh, next, please. Uh, the, the conference we are planning uh, this fall to uh, conduct uh, again for uh, parents, for families and for doctors. Next, please. And in uh, interne uh, interactions, uh, so uh, all kinds of interactions. So we are interacting with uh, Ministry of Health and Dist uh, Industry. We, we uh, fund a circle of kindness, federal uh, medical centers. So uh, biotech uh, companies and pharma companies, uh, DMD, Russian advocacy organizations, uh, which you see there are some of them. And when we need strategic decision for Ministry of Health and Ministry of uh, Industry, for example, we uh, uh, involve all the companies and we have all their signatures and we work as one team in order to uh, 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 request some decision for the problem of Duchenne's. And uh, again, international organization you see here in the list. And uh, last but not least, we have intercontinental non-formal DMD consulting group, which in includes uh, people from Europe, Asia, both America, Australia, and UK. And gives it gives us a lot of knowledge and a lot of support. And next, please. I think that is, and you see our uh, partners and uh, people, uh, organization who help us uh, to uh, do the work we are planning uh, in the world of Duchenne. And thank you so much and sorry for taking more time.
No, 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 I'm very, very happy. I mean, you are right on time. So thank you for that, Tatiana. And I think it's it's really amazing that um, you, as you're showing, I think I can move the slides, wait. Uh, in the other slides is that you are working together with a lot of organizations that are not just Duchenne and with this you have the power of the people and the power of numbers to start yeah. going to the Ministry of Health, going to the Ministry of Industry and, and really trying to make some, some things happen on a greater level. So I think that's a really, really great insight. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the next speaker and that is Nicolas from uh, DSG Duchenne, that is a patient organization in Chile. I'm just giving you the floor, Nicolas. Thank you, Susian. Uh, thank you, Nicoleta and Tatiana for your uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, tell you all that uh, right now, there's a few Duchenne organizations in Chile, actually three. One is uh, our organization, DSG Duchenne, and the other is Agrupación Duchenne Chile which is actually the organization from Josefina that she's here somewhere I can see her. But we are in the process right now of legally merging the two organizations. So instead of two little organizations, we have one big organization. That's why I have the two logos on the first page. And uh, you can see also there are email addresses in case you can reach us for anything. Next slide, Susian, please. Thank you. Uh, it's impossible to um, try uh, to tell you all what we do as a patient organization in Chile without telling you about the, a bit about the Chilean healthcare system because, first of all, Chile is not a well-known country, especially in these details, kind of like um, uh, how health works over here, where uh, everybody mostly knows how uh, the, the FDA or the EMA works, but Chile is not that well-known in that sense. So. First of all, even though we have a, I, I made two lists, the pros of the of living with Duchenne in Chile and the cons of living, living with Duchenne in Chile. Chile has overall good health indicators, pretty similar to the Organization for, for Economic Cooperation and Development in, in which Chile is a part of. And also we have a really uh, good uh, scientific system. We have actually many Chilean scientists working in different fields of Duchenne, but abroad and uh, well, uh, that's something important because we believe we have some scientific capabilities we can actually exploit it in Chile in favor for families and children. And also, uh, there's always the possibility of accessing genetic diagnosis, different Duchenne specialists such as neurologists, physiatrists, geneticists, and other health professionals uh, related to Duchenne, such as physical therapy, therapy. Uh, occupational therapy, uh, language uh, therapists, and well, you know, you know that right now. So you can actually access all of these professionals in Chile and they do exist. But, next slide, uh, Susian, please. Um, also, Chilean healthcare system has two hallmarks. First, it's really a complex system. You have public actors, private actors, you have complementary programs and laws, uh, so you have different uh, stakeholders and they all play different roles. So many times, uh, if you know, if you do not know the system well enough, you cannot work it in your favor in order to get the best healthcare access you can. So it actually requires a lot of uh, cultural capital to know how the system works so you can use it properly. And the second is that uh, we have a... Um, a uh, system that is uh, highly characterized by inequality, privatized access, and really, really, really high levels of out of pocket expenditures regarding uh, healthcare. So, all the things I mentioned before uh, neurologist appointments, genetic counseling, genetic diagnosis, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and blah, 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 blah. You can actually access all of that if you have money. But as uh, healthcare is pretty similar to what our society looks like, inequality is the hallmark of our society in, here in Chile. Actually, only a few people can access that in a, uh, in a way that it actually makes a change for that kids and that uh, family's life. Also, we have a Ministry of Health, but it's a ministry that uh, instead of uh, providing like a public policy regarding how to treat different 
health issues and public health issues, it's more like a cash register, you know, because as, um, as most systems are privatized, they only get like um, uh, what money comes in, what money goes out, how do you uh, use them? And that's mostly it. And we do have a national health strategic plan, but does not contemplate in any way orphan diseases such as Duchenne. So most people that lives with an orphan disease in Chile, that be Duchenne, that be ELA, a, 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 a spinal muscular atrophy or whatever you have and it's classified as an orphan disease. Uh, actually, you don't have that many spaces in our healthcare system because you don't have a lot of specialists. Uh, most specialists are um, available only in our uh, in Santiago, which is the the country's capital. So that's a really complex issue for any people, not only living with Duchenne but with any other orphan disease. Next slide, please, uh, Susian. So what's happening with the DMD community in Chile regarding these pros and regarding these pros? First, there's not one organized registry. So we don't know actually how many DMD patients do we have in Chile? Where are they located? How are they doing? Do they have their genetic diagnosis? Do, you, do they access genetic counseling? Are they taking prednisone? Are they taking the flasacord? Do they access any other kind of therapy? Um, so we don't even know uh, what's the life expectancy for someone living with Duchenne in Chile. So that's, that's kind of a big deal because we don't have an overall uh, expectancy of what's happening with our community. We can only look at that uh, uh, information um, through different institutions, but as, as like, such as hospitals, clinics, uh, some of them in Santiago, some of them in other parts of the, uh, uh, on the country, some of them private, some of them public, but those at the same time are really segregated by a, a socioeconomic levels, socioeconomic income. So uh, it's actually, we don't have a general picture and that's, that's hard because we need to have like a proper general look to what's happening to our kids, to our families here in Chile. Second, we do have specialized neuromuscular clinics. They do exist in Chile, but they are scarce and they are centralized. Most of them are in Santiago, except for the case of Fundación Teletón, which, which is an NGO that funnels uh, donations and charities and stuff. And they have centers for uh, most um, neuromuscular diseases, including the 10, in every part of, uh, of the country. But of course, uh, being the money always an issue with, um, uh, with, with this kind of institutions, um, the capacity is limited. So that's an issue too, because you don't have a, for example, when you do have physical therapy appointments for your son, they are not continuous during the year, but you do have cycles, for example, three months with physical therapy, three months without, three months with, and so. So that's, that's, uh, that's an issue too. Third, uh, most of Duchenne specialists in Chile have a pretty clear picture of what the standards of care look like, but they're accessible depending on where you live. Chile is not only uh, un, uh, characterized by inequality regarding uh, your, uh, your income, it's also really a centralized country. So most things are happening in Santiago, but not the rest of, of the country. There are also some other cities like, I don't know, Concepcion, eh, Valparaíso, which are big cities in Chile. But uh, if you don't live uh, near an, uh, a great urban area, probably your access to the standards of care, it's not as good as the people who are living in urban areas. Fourth, we do have access to standards to standard DMD uh, drugs uh, such as steroids, ACE inhibitors, and most uh, meds used for Duchenne in different stages of the condition. And we do have some access to newly developed drugs, specifically to the case of Adalurin, which is already approved in Chile. But the thing is to access, uh, not the standard drugs, you can access the standard drugs without that many problems. But if you do want to access 
adaluren or uh, other uh, new therapies such as, I don't know, any exon skipping uh, therapy. It's quite hard, not only because of the uh, economic issue, uh, but also because the process are really bureaucratic. Chile is a really, really, really bureaucratic country, uh, as you can see, uh, especially regarding this issue of the high complexity characteristics of our system. And fifth, uh, we have poor to little support for people living with disabilities. Of course, this includes people living with Duchenne. Uh, so again, if you have money, you can buy a proper wheelchair for your kid or you can access anything you can. And even if you have money, sometimes it's hard, but people who can't pay them for themselves and they don't have proper insurance, uh, they have to apply for it. And as there's a limited amount of uh, technical supports they give to patients, not all of people get it. So uh, that's an issue too. That's more or less what's happening to the DMD community in Chile. Next slide, uh, please, Susian. Uh, so, what do patients or uh, patient organizations do in Chile? No? Not just in Duchenne, but in general. First, uh, lobbying and advocacy uh, in legislati legislative, executive, and judicial state powers. Uh, what do I mean with that? Most of us know what it's lobbying and advocating in legislative and executive uh, powers uh, to get a, a new bill, to get to participate or be included in a new program. But for example. I make the case specifically in the judicial powers in Chile, because, for example, shut up. Um, uh, for example, if you want to access a Daluren for giving an example and you cannot pay for it as a Daluren, it's a high price drug that is not access. You cannot access uh, through any law or program. You have to sue the state to pay for it. Okay, my kid is going through this. I cannot pay it because this is a uh, six figure drugs. So uh, you have to sue the state and then you can get access. So many patient organizations do that support. So families and patients can sue the state and get access. But of course that is low and it's not the most, uh, it has not the, 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 the most efficacy because uh, those are not things that are in the budget of the Chilean, uh, 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 public budget, so it's always an issue. Second, of course, what Nicoleta and Tatiana were speaking recently, community building, uh, grouping people together, uh, looking out for the, what they need, what is happening today, and then, of course, after that comes locating and providing support uh, for patients and families in need. Uh, we are in, in our organization, we're not in that state yet, for example, but for example, there is a really successful Spinal Muscular Atrophy Association in Chile, who has actually in stock breathing machines and many other um, devices that helps these people. And they, uh, they, when the families cannot pay for it, they lend them to them freely until they don't need it anymore and they come back and go to another family. And that's, uh, for example, one of the cases. And of course, making awareness, educating general public and health professionals. So uh, um, our merging currently association is uh, working in, in those four, in this four. So uh, in the next slide, Susan, please, let me uh, tell you all what are we working right now. First, as, we, as I told you already, both organizations are merging. Uh, we expect uh, this merger to be finalized uh, in the next quarter. So um, uh, we will be one big organization called Fundación Duchenne Chile. Yeah, so uh, we will be changing our affiliation to World Ocean Organization. Instead of two small Chilean organization, we will have one big Chilean organization. Uh, second, we're working on the creation of the first national Duchenne registry. Well, we already have a few meetings about this to be uh, to have some counsel, for example, uh, from Elizabeth Vroom, who has been really helpful on Susian and also people in, well, in, in other organizations uh, inside and outside Chile. So we, were, we are hoping that during the second semester of this year, we will have our registry uh, going on, taking data, and of course, trying to get a, a big picture diagnosis of what is happening in our country with our patients, our kids, and, far, and our families. We are also educating DMD families in standards of care during 2020. We have a really big seminar with monthly sessions in each 
a relevant topic regarding Duchenne. Pulmonary care, uh, uh, cardiological care, physical therapy, psychosocial issues. We have a, a genetic counseling, accessing, we have a, spe a specific session on how to access treatments that you cannot pay for. So uh, we were working in 2020 really, really, really hard on, on updating family standards of care. And we actually had a pretty good run with a lot of families, not only from Chile, but from other countries in Latin America. Uh, going month to month as is, uh, uh, to our meetings to, to, to learn more about standards of care. And Josefina, because I'm, I'm going to give her all the credit uh, in this issue because she deserves it. She got the funds to train and to give uh, AMBU bags to uh, hospitals to, so they could get, get training in respiratory care for adults living with Duchenne. And that was a really, really, really big issue and all the grades to Josefina because she stand alone in that and she did wonderful. And so now many, many centers of Teleton Chile, for example, are aware of uh, pulmonary care in Duchenne, which is something that we did not have last year and this year we do have. Also, uh, we just finished another project that uh, with researchers, clinicians and other patient organizations we drafted a proposal for the first national registry for orphan diseases in Chile that was already delivered to our Ministry of Health. And now we have to start lobbying and advocating so that national strategy comes into a being and then hopefully into a law. And last but not least, as we're trying to create networks with international organizations, such as other patient organizations, pharmaceutical actors, and any other relevant stakeholders in the world of neuromuscular and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So uh, I, I, I know it sounds small regarding what other uh, patient organizations are doing right now, but for the Chilean system, which is precarious, which is highly bureaucratic, uh, this is our small but big uh, steps forward for not only for our organizations, but mainly for the people who suffer from this condition. Basically, that's all I wanted to tell you today. Thank you, Nicoleta. Thank you, Susian. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas, for this presentation. And congratulations on the merge with uh, Agrupa Chile. I know we that you're really happy. Yes, yes. I mean, she's wonderful as well. And uh, what I specifically love is that you're merging two enormous, strong organizations. And, you know, it's always peculiar if you have different patient organizations in a country because sometimes they work together sometimes completely not but I'm really really happy to see that you guys have found each other and that you're actively working together to uh, to make the Duchenne community in Chile better so thank you for that we actually have to uh, credit for that union uh, it's uh, World Duchenne organization is partly responsible for this union because we had a lot of time to talk in the Athens meeting uh, two years ago uh, this would, that's where actually Josefina and I met. So yeah, that was the starting point to a series of talks and conversation that led to this merger. So thank you, of course, for that. Oh, that's great to hear. Thank you. You see, great things happen in Athens. I really, really hope we should uh, we, we can re reunite next time, hopefully. But we'll see. So thank you, Sheila, uh, Nicolas. Let's hop on to our last speaker of today because I am pulling you all over the world. We went from Italy to Russia to Chile and the last stop is Australia. Because for this, I'm inviting Claire Bailey from Duchenne Australia to share her experience in setting up the Duchenne Australia. Claire, the floor is yours. Thank you, Suzanne and Nicoletta. Um, good evening, everybody. It's uh, almost 11 p.m. in Australia, so um, excuse me if I'm looking a little bit blurry-eyed, but um, thank you, Tatiana and Nicholas, for those wonderful presentations. Um, so yes, as Suzanne said, my name is Claire Bailey. Um, I've been in the advocacy space for Duchenne in Australia now for 13, over 13 years. When my son Logan was diagnosed, he's now, well, he's almost 20. Um, and I co-founded Duchenne Australia in, uh, on World Duchenne Awareness Day actually last year with Michael Simpson, who's also on the call, and he has an eight-year-old son, Harrison, uh, with Duchenne. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so our mission is, uh, we, well, we strive for all Australians living with Duchenne and associated dystrophinopathies to have access to evidence-based care and the best possible quality of life through advocacy, 
for emerging therapies, research and clinical trials, stronger together. Um, so we use the term dystrophinopathies because it needed to happen very strategically for our government um, so that female uh, manifesting carriers that had symptoms and had mobility issues were able to access um, our national disability insurance scheme, which I'll talk about a little more later. So next slide, please. So our key role in the community is um, to better have better futures for those living with Duchenne and the associated dystrophinopathies all across Australia by advocating to ensure that there is access to the evidence-based care for all and the best possible quality of life. Um, we have to advocate obviously for emerging therapies. Uh, we currently don't have any uh, access to any of uh, the, the therapies in Australia other than um, access to deflazacort. Um, they're all subsidized medicines over here, so they're very cheap and easy to access. But as for any of the exon skipping or mutation specific or you know, nonsense mutation therapies, we do not have um, access to those currently. Um, so our four key pillars that we focus on are care and support, awareness and education, research and data, and advocacy and collaboration. Next slide, please. So Australia is a big country. Um, there's quite a few of us that come from big countries, but I do like to just sort of stress that we're a huge country with a small population really. So um, our population is just under 26 million and that was the census from uh, for this year. And we're the 52nd most populated country in the world. Um, we have eight states and territories, which are all color coded there. And what that means is we have one overarching governance um, that manages health, which is the Commonwealth. But then every single state and territory has their own health system, um, own budgets, um, own laws and restrictions, etc. So we do operate se separately, but we do have one overarching governance. Um, we have six main clinical sites for Duchenne. So for a big country, that's very small. We do not have in each city 10, 20, you know, hospitals that have specialist services. It tends to be one or two in each of the states. Um, and so having standards of care and things have been a little bit easier to facilitate because we're not dealing with multiple people. Um, we've got a very small team of uh, very uh, experienced clinicians working in neuromuscular um, across all the specialities of cardiology, endocrinology, etc. And we currently have five clinical trial sites across Australia as well. So again, there's inequality um, with access to clinical trials. Next slide, please. So Australia is the sixth largest country in the world. Um, we're huge and I've put Europe in there because it fits so well. Um, it actually takes three days to cross Australia by train and five hours by plane. So again, when we're talking about clinical trials and access and equality to you know, participate in these trials, it's a big um, expectation of families to travel from one side of the country on the left of the screen that you can see Perth um, which is where Michael and I are we're in West Australia to say Sydney which is on the east coast of Australia so that would take us five hours on a plane or three days by train next slide please so in Australia, there's approximately a thousand people living with Duchenne, and uh, we currently don't know how many uh, other associated dystrophinopathy uh, patients uh, we have. So we have had registries in Australia for the last five years, but last year, well, probably the year before actually, so we're heading up to sort of two years of launching um, a new national registry called the Australian Neuromuscular uh, Diseases Registry. And so that registry now has around 400 plus registrants um, in the Duchenne specific um, registry. So that would be Duchenne, Becker, carriers and manifesting carriers. Um, so we're, as I said, spread across a huge geographical area um, and we've learned so much from COVID and that's both internationally and nationally about the importance of telehealth and being able to use Zoom or Teams, um, any of those sorts of platforms to keep the community connected. Um, and that's not just the community of parents and those living with um, Duchenne, it's the clinicians, um, industry, so Michael and I are always on Zoom calls with uh, different pharma companies around the world, all sort of different time zones, you know. So it's been good because it means it's really inclusive and we've managed to sort of attend as much as possible in the last uh, almost 12 months. 
So conferences have been very limited. There is usually a biannual conference in Australia um, and there's usually regular information days, but because of the COVID restrictions, we haven't had any of those now for 12 months. Um, we will be looking to do something online in that regard. Um, but as with lots of countries around the world, you know, Zoom, you can have fantastic conferences and have people, speakers from around the world still join. So we will be looking to that because the community really enjoy those opportunities. Um, we have very good relationships with the clinical trial sites, that's the clinicians, allied health, which Nicholas mentioned, the physios, OTs, etc., and the researchers. Um, information and education is really important, not just for the families, but also for the clinicians. So we have lots of um, people interested in uh, doing research in regards to physiotherapy and standards of care and occupational therapy. Um, there's a lot of research in Australia at the moment in genetics and genomics and newborn screening, for example. So um, we're being asked to provide a lot of information and education around the community needs and expectations when it comes to sort of carrier screening or newborn screening. So the difference between those are, so newborn screening is the screening performed on the baby at just after birth, like 24, 48 hours after birth. And carrier screening is the screening that's done pre-pregnancy um, on the mother and potentially the husband, depending on what the genetic condition is. Um, so yeah, we're doing a lot of work in that area. So it's also been really important for us, especially in the last 12 months with COVID to provide support and that's information support to industry, et cetera, as well as obviously very important support to our community. Um, and so advocacy, that's a completely different um, area as well of uh, our expertise and something that I um, sort of do lead the charge on a little bit um, in regards to uh, just experience and also um, knowledge of the health technology assessment, um, health economics and all those sorts of areas. So we're putting together a lot of information and work alongside the registry to make sure that the Duchenne community have a very strong voice to government when we have some um, additional information for emerging therapies, such as gene therapy, for example. So the very expensive drugs. Um, we've seen SMA drugs being approved in Australia. We have three approved funded gene therapies for SMA. So we do know when there is a very good, uh, safe, efficacious drug that we will hopefully have access to it. We just need to make sure we have all of the data to support that application. And again, I've just written the registry again because I can't say it enough. It's one of the most important tools that we have in Australia. Um, it's the community's voice. It's our, um, it's our community hub really, because if you're not on the registry, we don't know where you are. One, we can't help, but also we can't make sure that you have information and also be able to represent you know, your specific story when it comes to um, giving information to government and the payers. Next slide, please. So the other really important area in the community is standards of care, which everyone has mentioned. We're not perfect in Australia. We're a first world country. We're very affluent. We're very lucky and we know that. Um, but we do let our community down in lots of areas. So Duchenne Australia are a very clear advocate for um, standards of care. Uh, and that's every age and stage. So there's always been... Um, uh, a focus on paediatrics um, and in Australia paediatrics is anyone under 18 but transition which means paediatrics to adults occur from the age of 14 um, and once people do get to the adult system they seem to drop off um, and no one really sort of follows them up with the same diligence as they do when they are in the paediatric system so we are really um, looking to make sure that there isn't that gap and we call that lifespan so instead of having children or adults, we're calling it lifespan. So from diagnosis through to end of life. Um, as we mentioned with newborn screening and carrier screening, um, we're obviously raising awareness around early diagnosis. So that's also across uh, physicians, um, GPs or primary care, um, right through to physiotherapists, teachers, um, whoever will listen to us really. Um, support for the community is very, very paramount. And one of the reasons uh, Duchenne Australia was started was because of the gap we saw in mental health and resilience for families, siblings, and those living with uh, Duchenne or dystrophinopathy. Um, so we're doing a lot of community work around mental health and we're about to launch that program and a survey in the next few weeks. 
Um, NDIS, which I mentioned, is our National Disability Insurance Scheme. I don't know why they've got insurance in there because it's not an insurance model. What it is, is um, an application process to uh, have a plan and a pot of money so that you can access the services outside of clinical care. So not not um, your doctor, but things like physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. Um, if you need a new wheelchair, you get an assessment and then you get approved or not approved and a funder and a, a pot of money. So again, we're very lucky. Um, it's led to a strange uh, community understanding of the system where people literally want everything <laughs> you can think of like um, different flooring and oh, just sorts, sorts of all, all sorts of things so the criteria is it has to be reasonable and necessary so anyway it's up, open to interpretation um, information and education as we said the community want to know they want to know what we're talking about if we go to government they want to know not before not after we go they want to know before we go they want to make sure that we get our story right they want to make sure that their um, specific story can be heard um, and it's really about us managing expectations and making sure that we can take the strongest um, story forward um, we're trying to have a strong social media presence. Again, we're new to this, you know, we've only been going for less than 12 months. So we're doing our very best in regards to social media. Um, we're a volunteer organization, so time is very precious. And um, so we do our very best to, to try and keep that up to date. Um, and doing the Zoom webinars. So that image there, we'll be launching um, at the beginning of next week, our Zoom support and education um, program, which will be called Community. So Community, we're trying to be a bit clever there. Um, we're doing a lot of work with research and data again, and that's alongside the registry. So it's not just about the registry as it is now, we're building those data sets alongside Treat and MD to have expanded data sets, post-market surveillance, et cetera. So it's not the sexy stuff as I tell Michael, it's not really what families want to be knowing, but we've got to make sure that we're across all of these things. Um, advocacy and collaboration has been uh, mentioned before, and that's very important when it comes to organizations such as um, uh, World of Shen organization and the international collaborations that we have. We're very grateful for that peer support that we have, and it's wonderful to be connected with you all today. So next slide. So again, we're just raising awareness, the importance of the registry and its role, because people get fed up with telling their story hundreds of times, um, how that uh, data then informs research and how that's used by re in, um, industry as well and as researchers. Um, it informs decisions on whether clinical trials come to countries. So again, really important to have a really um, good registry. It is, informs our decision makers in government and the payers, so HTA in regards to getting drugs reimbursed. And it obviously helps us have a voice in the international community um, with World of Shen and our partner organizations in Treat MMD. Next slide. Um, and really important to our community last year, it was the day we launched uh, World of Shen Awareness Day to see those red balloons across social media just really lifted the community spirit and I think it's really important to have that day where we all come together but there needs to be 365 days awareness so it's always sharing supporting each other around the world if people have got other initiatives it's sharing and showing our support um, taking you know experience from others and just seeing what we can use ourselves. Um, making sure that people have access to care, that all that information gets out. So it's really about information sharing for us in the next 12 months. We're going to be doing the standards of care in an Australian context, more advocacy to government, and obviously working a lot more in the research and data space as well. Um, is there another one or is that it? <laughs> that's it, that's it. And that's I think <laughs> perfect timing. Yes, and I saw you, you put on your timer, didn't you? I did. I do. I love it. Because I do, I do like to talk, especially when I'm tired. Also, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. And I think I think it's really interesting to see, like, because you got such um, almost like patchwork community throughout Australia, because it's a humongous country. I mean, I'm from the Netherlands. I think we fit 52 times into Australia, if not more. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's really interesting to see how you pick up, especially this telehealth part and about creating community because what we've been doing in the COVID time you've been doing before because you are that spa you know you're, you're that um, uh, big as a country so I think we can learn an awful lot from that so thank you for that um, 
This is actually the end of our speaker conversations. As you can see here on the slide, open discussion. Please join the conversation. I'm going to stop the screen share. And what I'm also going to do is stop the uh, recording. Very close to the end of the meeting. And uh, we really thank you for participating. Thank you to our speakers for sharing these fantastic experiences. And um, Suzanne, do you want to uh, close the, the meeting? Yes, yes. Uh, I just want to, to echo what Nicoletta is saying. I want to thank the speakers, all of you, for your presentations and all the participants for sharing their, their stories. I'm, I'm always happy that we have such a small group that we can really, you know, share things in, in, in confidence. Um, I know that this webinar um, will be put on our Duchenne Data Foundation YouTube. Once you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to either Nicoletta or me, or of course, via to, to Claire, to Nicholas, to, to anyone who, who was joining this, uh, this meeting. Um, and I think that's it. I would like to thank you all. I think this is a wrap up and I uh, hope to see you soon in the next webinar that I will be sure to, uh, to email you about what the topic is and what the speakers are. So thank you for that. And I wish you all a very happy day.